This is Open Door with Vince Robinson. In-depth conversations with people who are making a difference in the lives of others here and around the world. Culture is at the heart of who you are. Know your culture, find yourself on Open Door with Vince Robinson. Grand Dawning, Cleveland, Ohio, and the rest of planet Earth, welcome to another edition of Open Door with Vince Robinson. My guest is the chairman of the African People's Socialist Party. He is currently uh, involved in a controversy that has him facing charges that have been levied by the federal government, and we're going to talk about what those charges are and um, how he feels about them. But I also would like to give him an opportunity to talk about the African People's Socialist Party and what it is doing because it far overshadows the controversy that exists at present. His name is Omali Yeshitela, and he is the chairman of the African People's Socialist Party. Welcome to Open Door with Vince Robinson. Thank you so very much, Brother Vince. Uh, I appreciate uh, having access to this platform that helps us to break out of this uh, kind of information uh, encirclement that has been imposed uh, on us um, to participate in this war of ideas um, that we're engaged in all the time. So I appreciate you so much for offering this uh, platform to us. Thank you. And I want to express my appreciation for extending the courtesy to me for this interview. I realize that you have been doing what you have been doing for a long time and uh, it is a significant part of the history of this country when you talk about struggle against oppression and some of the other things that African-centered uh, people have had to endure in the United States and around the world. So thank you for providing me with the opportunity to have this conversation. So before we get into the details of what you're dealing with right now, I just want to give folks a sense of what the African People's Socialist Party is why it was created, and what its mission is. Well, I think it's uh, really important to uh, establish the fact, first of all, that um, I'm 82 years old, and uh, I was born uh, into a situation 82 years ago that I had nothing to do with creating, uh, but that African people, black people, who uh, were kidnapped and thrust uh, uh, into this country under colonial bondage have been fighting uh, in some way or another uh, since that time. I'm fortunate enough to have uh, have been born uh, in the 1940s, 1941 for that matter, uh, when incredible uh, struggles were uh, happening uh, throughout the world by people who were not white against colonial white power. Uh, if you uh, probably are aware that 1947, that was the year in the, uh, India became independent, 1949, of course, we saw China uh, become independent in the 50s, the struggles in, of people in Cuba throughout Latin America and struggles that were happening in Africa and in this country. So it was like a just a marvelous vortex of uh, contradictions coming together that informed my consciousness and, and really made a determination of how uh, I had to move. It was common in every household you would go in my childhood where people were engaged in what had come to be known as race talk, the conditions of black people here and other places around the world and how we were trying to contend with them. In 19, uh, 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 in 19, uh, something like uh, 58, uh, I, uh, at, the, at 18 years of uh, age, uh, I decided to, uh, to leave St. Petersburg, Florida, where I was born, where I grew up, uh, and to join the U.S. Army. I, I listened to uh, the propaganda, join the Army, see the world. I assumed uh, in some ways that the conditions that I saw confronting black people had a lot to do with where we were located in this small southern city. I joined the Army. I ended up uh, uh, ultimately in Berlin, Germany. I was uh, uh, in one of the first tanks to face a Russian tank in a combat mode. I was there when the Berlin Wall uh, was created. Uh, I, I, I left Berlin uh, uh, after about three years and uh, was stationed uh, in Fort Benning, Georgia, uh, uh, by which time the civil rights movement had begun to heat up in a very serious way in this country. African people were catching hell. The soldiers who were working uh, for the U.S. government who 
would go uh, uh, on the weekend, take weekend passes and go uh, uh, into Columbus, Georgia, uh, would often come back blood- bloodied and beaten by cops and that kind of thing. That, that along with what was happening in terms of the civil rights movement and, and how African people were being treated helped to, helped to also further uh, define my consciousness. I began a, a movement on that base in Fort Benning, Georgia, uh, protesting the treatment of African people uh, there around the world. I wrote uh, then-President John F. Kennedy a 13-page letter telling him I didn't want to be in that military anymore. I didn't want to cooperate uh, uh, with the government that treated African people the way we were being treated in the United States. Uh, and so uh, ultimately uh, I was uh, uh, given uh, a discharge from the, U- uh, from the, from the United States uh, military. I went back into St. Petersburg, Florida, angry as hell, uh, because I feel like, uh, as Malcolm would characterize, I had been duped and bamboozled. Uh, and uh, uh, shortly after getting back to St. Petersburg, Florida, I began organizing uh, in the community against the segregated uh, bowling alleys and other kinds of uh, institutions uh, that uh, existed in that city and sometimes in my own community. Uh, uh, I, I joined the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, uh, that would uh, eventually put forth the slogan, Black Power, uh, and that helped to change the civil rights movement uh, from just a movement trying to integrate uh, into the system of our uh, oppression and uh, uh, put the struggle of African people in this country on par uh, with the struggle of other peoples around the world. It was a struggle for power, which meant that it was an anti-colonial struggle. And that's part of what helped to shape uh, and form my consciousness. As a member of SNCC, on December uh, 29, 1966, after leading a march to the City Hall in St. Petersburg, Florida, uh, uh, protesting uh, in part the uh, a ten, uh, uh, an eight by 10 foot uh, horrendous mural uh, that had been on that wall since the 1930s that depicted black people in grotesque caricature with elongated limbs and huge uh, pink lips over most of our face and what have you. Uh, and and uh, on one occasion during one of the demonstrations, uh, I went into the city hall uh, with a couple of other uh, young people and snatched a mule off the wall. I was uh, charged uh, with 11 offenses, uh, including grand larceny. I was tried for grand larceny, uh, given a five-year prison sentence. Uh, uh, and, you know, that helped to shape uh, some of the direction uh, that I would be involved in. I was in and out of prison on bond for that. I uh, uh, was organizing throughout the state of Florida uh, as a SNCC organizer. In prison, I organized uh, uh, the Hunter Militant Organization because the United States government was moving in a very serious way against SNCC, uh, had begun framing people up, uh, uh, putting people in jail, prison, uh, et cetera. Uh, and uh, so, so uh, it, 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 it had to come to conclusion uh, that uh, protest politics was just not enough, uh, that we had to have uh, a, a capacity for fighting for uh, winning and, and exercising uh, political power. And so a political party uh, became the venue, uh, became the vehicle that we used to do that. And that was the basis of the founding of the African People's Socialist Party. And clearly, uh, in short order, with everything that was happening in the world, including assassinations of leaders in this country, uh, including uh, Vietnam and and wars being made uh, globally against oppressed people, Cuba, uh, what have you, the emergence of forces like Che Guevara, the growing influence of Franz Fanon, uh, who was helping to uh, really expand an understanding of the colonial question. Uh, uh, with all of these things happening, it became clear to us that neither it was not enough just to uh, uh, try and make struggle uh, limited to uh, the, the borders that have been created by our oppressors, that the struggle for black people uh, in this country and globally had, uh, had uh, gone beyond the limitations imposed on us by these artificial borders, these false borders uh, that separated us as black people from each other around the world, 
uh, that defined us and separated us from the struggles of other peoples around the world. And so we created the African Socialist International, uh, which is uh, uh, an organization uh, that extends the, the uh, party, African People's Socialist Party, to various places around the world, uh, uh, throughout Africa, uh, certain several places in Africa. We're in Europe. Uh, we're here uh, in North America. Uh, we're in the Caribbean, uh, et cetera. So that's kind of a condensed uh, version of, uh, of, of, of my history and how that uh, is related to uh, the founding, founding of the African People's Socialist Party. I think it's important to point out the fact that you had things like COINTELPRO that were uh, alive and well, so to speak, during that time. And we saw as a result of that assassinations of uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, Malcolm X. Uh, But on an international level, uh, we saw what happened to Kwame Nkrumah. We saw what happened to Patrice Lumumba and and many others who were involved in the struggle for the rights of of African people around the world. So I heard you mention the idea of uh, African internationalism, and I think you just spoke to the need for that. Uh, I want to give you an opportunity to expand on that, but I also want to talk to you about the 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 idea of socialism within uh, the name of your party. Uh, how does socialism relate to the work that you are doing? Well, uh, the fact is that um, it didn't take us very long to find out that the foundation of capitalism, Karl Marx talked about it being something like primitive accumulation, the the, the origin of the capitalist system itself. He said, you know, tra- uh, uh, something like transforming Africa into a commercial, uh, uh, to a, a place of commercial hunting of black skins. And he talked about how that was uh, also related to interring indigenous people uh, in this country into the mines, bringing up gold and silver uh, uh, that went into the process. Uh, the, eight, the war, 1841-42, I think, was opium war. Uh, that turned China into uh, a, a country of dope addicts to get uh, opium uh, to, to England. Uh, and all of these things, uh, if you mention even uh, uh, East India, the war that was being made against the people of India, all of this results in the creation of uh, the accumulation of the capital necessary for, uh, for capitalist production. And and uh, it became clear to us that capitalism is a blood-sucking parasitic uh, system, and it had to be those things because it rested upon the foundation of uh, stealing land, resources, life uh, from African and other peoples around the world, and that the alternative to capitalism uh, was socialism. And capitalism, as we understand it, being uh, private ownership of, of the means and production in the hands of private forces, uh, and on the other, on the one hand, while on the other hand, uh, we had a situation of socialized production. Peoples all around the world and inside this country are connected in some way or another, uh, uh, producing stuff that uh, that was uh, privately owned. This is this is a profound contradiction, and all of this uh, uh, occurs on the foundation of uh, stolen indigenous land, of uh, stolen African labor of uh, the colonial uh, mode of production that extends uh, uh, this kind of slavery uh, around the globe. And so uh, it's, it's naturally normal. My daddy, you know, who was a laborer on the railroads, uh, 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 and the neighborhood I lived in was uh, one of uh, black working people who struggling to do everything we could live. And, and, they, and I came to understand how working people around the world were, uh, were connected to, uh, to this process, and we had nothing, uh, while those uh, who didn't work but owned the means of production, et cetera, had everything. So okay. you have uh, people who build houses being homeless, uh, while people who don't do any kind of labor, any kind of work at all, are owning not only homes but the means by which homes are being built. So this is something that helped to convince me that it was not good enough just to talk about uh, uh, freedom, et cetera, that there was a social system at work. And that social system actually was the colonial mode of production upon which rested uh, uh, the whole uh, capitalist apparatus. So, okay. I mean, I know that's a rather yeah. uh, long way uh, okay. to getting to it, but that's sort of what helped to inform okay. us. Okay. We're going to talk a bit more about what socialism is when we return 
Uh, and I want to take a deep dive into it just so that folks get a better picture of what it actually is. You're listening to Open Door with Vince Robinson on 95.9 FM WOVU. My guest is Omali Yeshitela. He is the chairman of the African People's Socialist Party. We'll be right back on this Burton Belcar Community Radio Station. Ohio, a new choice for Medicaid is here. Anthem Blue Cross and Blue Shield, the name you can trust because we're the plan that plans on everything from 3 a.m. fevers to life-saving medicines. So choose Anthem for your Medicaid plan. Visit AnthemOhio.com today. This was brought to you by Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield Insurance and WOVU 95.9 FM. Our voices united. Burton Bell Car Community Radio. Hi, this is Annette. You're listening to WOVU 95.9 FM. Our voices united. Burton Bell Car Community Radio. Welcome back to Open Door with Vince Robinson and my guest, Mr. Omali Yesitela, chairman of the African People's Socialist Party. Uh, Before we took the break, we were talking a bit about uh, capitalism versus socialism And as you were explaining uh, the reason for socialism as a part of your party platform, I couldn't help but think of what you might see as a vision of of an America that would embrace socialism versus capitalism, which, as you pronounced it, seems to be uh, an exploitative paradigm. Talk about what socialism would look like in America if it were embraced by the masses. I, I, first of all, I want to say that I'm not talking about some kind of uh, Bernie Sanders uh, Walmart socialism uh, based on the assumption that people get $15 an hour over a number of years. Uh, when you talk about socialism, you're talking about uh, uh, a social system, and capitalism is a social system. They cannot coexist. You can't have capitalism and socialism as a part of the same system. In order for co- socialism to really emerge, uh, then the capitalist social system that's based on exploitation has its foundation on slavery and genocide. That system has to go. And so uh, there's the, the notion that somehow we will uh, sort of graduate toward uh, socialism, uh, uh, we think it's far-fetched. That uh, it has never happened any place in the world, and it will not happen here, one. Two, uh, when we talk about America, I think it's really important uh, from our perspective to recognize that America is part of a global social system. Uh, how would socialism look in America? <clears throat> First of all, there is not going to be a, a kind of American socialism, uh, an American exceptional uh, kind of process. It's going to happen as a part of the deconstruction of a whole world order that exists today. At one time, uh, there were people who called themselves Marxists, Maoists, etc., who sort of accepted the responsibility uh, as revolutionaries uh, to wage a struggle uh, that would mean uh, the emancipation of all the workers of the world. That's not the case anymore. Uh, right at the present, for most of the people who characterize themselves as socialists, they, they are the Bernie uh, Sanders-type socialists that sort of assume that, uh, that the capitalists would change their ways, change their heart, uh, and that would offer X numbers of dollars per hour uh, for uh, downtrodden working people. That's not going to happen. What has happened First of all, is anybody who's genuinely uh, concerned and genuinely committed to socialist uh, uh, socialism uh, have to, first of all, acknowledge uh, that the whole capitalist system rests upon the foundation of the exploitation of black people, uh, the exploitation of the indigenous people, the theft of, of the land. I say indigenous, I include uh, the Mexican people who lost half of Mexico uh, in uh, 1848, who have... Uh, 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 children uh, being thrown in the cages on the southern border in this country who are called illegal aliens by the people, who sto- the aliens who stole this land and created uh, a-, a system on top of it. So I don't think there's going to be any kind of American uh, socialism. I think we're talking about a global process that African people are part of, as well as indigenous people, as well as people all around the world. That's why you see everywhere you look, I mean, America's fighting people in Yemen, fighting people in in, in places uh, like Venezuela and Nicaragua and Cuba, uh, 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 throughout the Middle East, et cetera. This is a whole colonial system that's in a state of disintegration that they're trying to contain and control by killing and locking up people and by putting me in prison. So the socialism that we are talking about 
uh, will be a global expression of, uh, of the aspiration of the people to be able uh, to meet uh, our material needs, uh, to be able to feed, clothe, and house ourselves, to have control of the process of, uh, of production, uh, how that works and, and distribution of resources will break down borders uh, that create competition, artificial competition that appears to be between uh, countries, but actually between bloodthirsty uh, capitalist enterprises, uh, etc. Uh, you won't have the same kind of economic crisis that we see happening now, what they call overproduction, things like this, because you, the borders are gone, and the people, the working people now uh, are in authority, and, and we're not competing with each other. We have access now uh, to uh, an ability to, to meet our own material needs and things like that. You have you have the emancipation of the culture of the people, the humanity of the people, uh, where you now we live in a situation where the culture itself, you know, is something that has been colonized and, 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 and distorted to meet the requirements and, uh, of, uh, of our oppressors, et cetera. So that's part of what it is we're talking about. And so I know it's not like the kind of formula that uh, people uh, you know, uh, often talk about where, again, you just get some economic raises and the workers get treated better, et cetera. No, we're talking about the working class becoming the ruling class uh, uh, in the process of destroying system uh, based on class. Uh, uh, class. Uh, so that's part of what it is that we're talking about. And I, I don't know if I spoke uh, specifically, but the resources of, of Africa, uh, you look at the situation where we live in a world right now uh, where 80% of the people on the planet Earth are trying to survive of uh, 10 U.S. dollars or 12 U.S. dollars or, or, or less a day, where 50% uh, of the people on the planet Earth are trying to survive uh, uh, of something like uh, $2.50 a day. And if you live uh, uh, in Africa, uh, people often work for just one meal a day, just trying to make a meal. That, 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 that's a part of a whole global social system. That, that makes uh, a mockery of this whole notion about the 99% uh, versus the 1%. Yeah, 1% may own and control most of everything else, but uh, a vast, a significant uh, 20% uh, live well uh, at the expense of 80% of the people on the planet. If you should take a Google map of Africa uh, at night, and, and see and, and compare that to Europe and compare that to North America, and you see there are barely any lights because we don't have electricity, because we don't have access to clean water. So my, my point is that uh, there is not going to be an American socialism because America is not going to be able to continue to live off the blood and resources of people everywhere else around the world. And part of our responsibility as genuine socialists is to take these resources and un in unity with other peoples around the world, in unity with the indigenous people uh, here uh, uh, throughout the Americas. How many millions and scores of millions of uh, so-called indigenous people died in the process of creating this social system? We, we, are not that, uh, we are not fighting for that kind of, uh, of a parasitic uh, uh, socialism uh, that, can, that we pre presumes to uh, continue to exist at the expense of other people's resources. We're going to have freedom. And that means people have access to our own resources. That means the working people will be able uh, to control uh, the rules. Uh, workers won't be, you won't have people dying as they do uh, in these mines because the workers won't go into mines because they're in control of the, uh, that are unsafe, won't go there for profit. Profit won't be the driving force uh, in the society that we are talking about. And, and uh, as safety uh, will be uh, not sacrificed for profit, uh, for working people. Uh, we will work to create a life for, for our people because we've been in charge of the determinations of what, what it should look like. And, you know, again, uh, you know, I know it's a relatively long-winded kind of response, but I'm struggling in this discussion uh, with I, what I believe and what our party believes uh, happen to be just a lot of distorted assumptions about socialism and capitalism, and these are assumptions that have been imposed uh, uh, on our consciousness by the ones who control the society now and by opportunists who want a piece of this society uh, and who see the collapse of the, of the whole capitalist system happening all around them. That's what all these wars are about. And they're trying to hedge their bet by calling this capitalism by another word, uh, um, having a kinder, gentler capitalism, if you will, that they want to call socialism. 
Well, when you talk about that and you think about organizations like the World Economic Forum and the impact that they're having on global politics and the influence that they have on certain governments and corporations, uh, it just seems as though this massive transfer of wealth is taking place and and it means destroying the so-called middle class in America and probably in other countries uh, in the world. But you are talking about the empowerment of a people to, I guess, push back against the controls that are being exerted against them. Uh, I'm just wondering uh, what your thought is about a slogan such as you will own nothing and be happy and how that will affect us uh, as people who live in the respective countries that we live in. <laughs> I, I, that's a really uh, a deep kind of announcement. I mean, obviously, to say uh, you will own nothing and be, to be happy, that's the kind of reality that most of, of Africans and, and colonized people around the world uh we experience owning nothing, uh, and uh, and we are made mock- mockery of uh, by the assumption that we are supposed to be happy. I remember as a young person, I would hear uh, white people who would commonly say things like that. Uh, 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 I would I would love to be a black person on Friday night because that's supposed to be this explosion of happiness among and uh, among enslaved people, and you know this whole notion of the happy-go-lucky. Uh, African slave is something that permeates much of the uh, earlier history. So that's what what many people. That's what I think that might mean. I've never heard this slogan uh, before. Uh, it may be something that people of saying to besmirch the idea of socialism, which means uh, the destruction of uh, of, of, of uh, the private property, uh, a social system where the where the ruling class would own and control the means of production. Uh, private, and they would extend that uh, to uh, the notion that somehow you won't have your own house, you won't have this and that because there's this ominous uh, force that's there. That may be uh, what's being inferred here. But what we are saying is that, uh, uh, that all of the means of production should be collectively owned by the people. We're saying that uh, uh, we're not saying that uh, that ownership would disappear right away, but we are saying that uh, uh, it would be socialized as opposed to private ownership. And that's the fundamental contradiction that we're dealing with. One, two, when we talk about uh, the struggle for the liberation of a people, uh, you see this happening all the time, and it's happened for a very long time. The consequences of that struggle, however, has to be uh, uh, transforming uh, the, the society that we live in. So. Uh, all over Africa, there have been this, there's, there's these uh, movements that were about, uh, presu- presumably, uh, the liberation of the people. But, but what people came to power was the African petty bourgeoisie, a social force that was created in the image of, uh, of our colonizers, etc., and did nothing to uplift the conditions of our people. In fact, they don't build universities, they don't build hospitals or anything like that throughout Africa. And you have most of the heads of states in Africa going to Europe and going to, to Saudi Arabia and places like that for health care, but the masses of our people don't do without. We're talking about something absolutely different then. We're talking about uh, uh, the leadership of the struggle of, the, of our people uh, being uh, led by uh, the African working class itself, who are in the process of making national liberation uh, also struggling to, uh, uh, to uh, transform ourselves from the working class to the ruling class, a new ruling class that's temporarily necessary in order to protect the, uh, the interests of the, of, the, of the whole nation and to uh, change and transform uh, the kind of society that, that we live in. Okay. So, um, yeah. Okay. I do want to talk about African leadership because I think that's part of the problem. And I'm not talking about all African leaders because I think that there are some who do have the right idea, but then there are some who are beholden to the interests of the colonizers. We're going to talk about that, and we're also going to talk about this case that you're involved in when we return. This is Open Door with Vince Robinson on 95.9 FM WOVU, Burton Bell Car Community Radio. My guest is Omali Yeshitela. He is the chairman of the African People's Socialist Party. We'll be right back.
Koshin Meats is a family-owned business that has served the Cleveland area for over a century. Their staff can help you select specialty cuts of beef, poultry, pork, and other items you may not find in an ordinary grocery store like frog legs or wild jerky. They also offer a wide variety of breads, deli meats, cheeses, spices, and other specialty products. Conveniently located at 4058 St. Clair Avenue near East 41st Street, Koshin Meats is the place to go for all your cuisine needs. Call 216-881-7677 for more info or visit koshinmeats.com. This message was brought to you by Koshin Meats and Marketplace and WOVU 95.9 FM, Our Voices United, Burton Bell Car Community Radio. We're back on Open Door with Vince Robinson and the conversation with Chairman O'Malley Yeshitela. He is someone who was involved in the founding of the organization. It's been, I guess, about six decades, so he's not a newcomer to this, but uh, he has been involved in a struggle based on some charges that were levied against him and two others. I want to give you an opportunity to talk about this case, what's uh, wrong with it, uh, what you feel is unjust about it. I'm sure that there is much that you can share about that, but just to give some perspective And we have talked about in uh, an earlier segment, we've talked about some of the things that have happened in this country to oppose things that involve African intellectualism and organizing around addressing the needs of the people in this country because they aren't being properly addressed. So uh, the floor is yours, Chairman. Uh, Tell us about this case. Tell us about the injustice of it. And uh, we'll give the folks who are listening a better picture of of what your situation is right now well thank you so much uh, uh dear brother uh, i just want to say that um on uh, july 29th of 2022 uh, my wife and i uh here in st louis uh, where i'm living uh were seated at the dining room table uh at five o'clock in the morning my wife uh who had the uh, the more than 50 some odd economic uh, institutions that the party has created uh, uh, that we call the construction of a dual power that would put power in the hands of the working class. Uh, and she was to preside over uh, on that morning uh, at the Uhuru House, our headquarters here uh, in St. Louis, uh, the, the uh, inauguration of a, a program that would train uh, 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 up to 20 uh, African women as doulas uh, to be able uh, to uh, provide safe births uh, for children and for mothers. And in St. Louis, we live in a city here that enough black babies die in the first year of life to fill 15 uh, kindergarten classes. So that was an important thing. And uh, we were sitting uh, talking about the day and uh, what was the day was going to look like, and, and, and this extraordinary racket comes from outside that startled us. And initially, we weren't sure what they were saying, uh, but it was over some kind of loudspeaker device that was demanding that the people, the residents, come out with our hands up and hands empty, that this is the FBI. Um, and so uh, I went downstairs asking my wife to stay behind and to call uh, the people and let them know that we were being attacked. And she was unsuccessful in calling them because they had jammed our phone. So when I get downstairs, uh, I run into the site of an uh, armored vehicle in front of the house. Uh, uh, it's a military force uh, uh, carrying assault weapons uh, standing in front of the house uh, and in the neighbor on the neighbor's porches next door. Uh, they have, uh, I'm, I'm greeted w- with this uh, lasers targeting device with red dots bouncing off my chest. And, of course, I'm remembering Fred Hampton and how they murdered him uh, on December 4th, 1969, and assumed this is what was going to happen to me. I did make it downstairs. I, I, my wife, when she followed me outside this downstairs, was uh, almost hit in the face by a drone that they had sent up into the house. And so we get downstairs, they, they, uh, they zip tie my hands behind my back, they take my uh, information from me, my phone, my whatever other wa- stuff might have been in my wallet, <clears throat> and my wife, uh, they handcuff her behind her back. They, they go into our house, they tell us, uh, ultimately, eventually, they tell us that 
uh, that there's going to be uh, 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 some indictment of a Russian national who's in Russia. And should he ever come to this country, they, they're going to, uh, to, to jail him. Uh, but uh, later that morning, they said there was uh, this indictment is going to be uh, released uh, uh, in Tampa, Florida, federal court in Tampa, Florida. And uh, this is going to make big news, we were told. And so what happened uh, uh, was, as I mentioned, we were handcuffed. I didn't know it at the time, but uh, at the same time, across town, uh, uh, on the predominantly white side of St. Louis and the south side, uh, the Solidarity Center, the center that we have there, uh, that's occupied uh, by, uh, by white people who do reparations work and solidarity work in the white community, that was being raided too. Uh, like at my house, they, they had used flashbang grenades. Uh, they had uh, used uh, things to cover up the, the, the uh, ability to, uh, for their actions to be videoed, ca captured on video. They had used battering ramps to knock down doors, to break windows. They had gone in and stolen materials. They had uh, gone uh, to the apartment upstairs and handcuffed the couple who lived up there, uh, uh, Jesse Neville, uh, who was one of the people who uh, facing charges with me, uh, uh, and his now wife. And uh, so they occupied. They, they took uh, all kinds of recording devices, uh, they went and, and, and took uh, records, financial and other kinds of records there. They were doing the same thing in St. Petersburg, Florida, where they raided, raided the Uhuda house there uh, uh, in South St. Petersburg, African community. They went to my house in St. Petersburg, Florida, because that's where I, I had lived uh, for most of the time. Nobody was there. Uh, they broke in. They knocked down doors. They stole computers. They stole uh, recording devices. They went to the Hura House in St. Petersburg. They took our radio station temporarily off the air. Uh, they went into our archives with 40, uh, 50 years of uh, archived history, things like that, and took some materials from there. They took financial records, uh, et cetera. And then uh, they didn't charge us. Uh, they characterized, they said they were serving a search warrant. And they, they characterized uh, us as unindicted co-conspirators, that we were, in, we were co-conspiring uh, with the Russian uh, national who was in Russia. And uh, they said that a trip that I had taken to Moscow, I think this was in 2015, uh, uh, I took two trips to Moscow to attend conferences sponsored by a non-governmental organization that was dealing with the question of self-determination of peoples around the world, uh, that I became an employee of Russia, and that they said uh, uh, that uh, elections that we ran in 2017 and 2019 in St. Petersburg, Florida, we for one for mayor, the other uh, for uh, city council, uh, were paid for by the Russians. They told us to pay, do that. They said that... Uh, the campaign we had initiated uh, collecting signatures uh, from people and traveling around uh, the United States uh, following the United Nations who happened to be traversing the United States uh, investigating the conditions of black people in this country. They said that our work there had to do uh, was Russian funded. The Russians had us to do this. And so uh, this was the incredible charge that they imposed on us. And what they charged us uh, ultimately uh, was a federal criminal statute that's used to prosecute uh, members uh, 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 who are engaged, people who are engaged and employed by foreign agents, almost like, like, like spies or something to that effect. It says that it, it, it was, uh, we were supposed to be unregistered foreign agents, uh, uh, and they used something called uh, 18 U.S.C. Uh, 951, uh, and uh, to target uh, political or dissenting speech. And this is the only time in history uh, that this thing, uh, 80 years old, that this thing, this, this, this law, uh, 80 years old, uh, it's only been used uh, something like uh, 20 times or maybe 24 times uh, in all 80 years. It's never been used before around issues of just pure speech. And so this is what they charged us with. And then something like uh, nine months after this raid. And this was a horrible thing because, you see, uh, if they didn't charge us, we have no legal standing.
which means that we couldn't go to the court and say, hey, you know, stop them from doing this, et cetera, because they hadn't charged us with anything. So nine months later, uh, they do indict us. And uh, we had to go into Tampa for a hearing. They indicted us. They put me uh, in chains, handcuffs, uh, uh, leg irons, and what have you, uh, photographed me. Uh, they did the same thing to Penny Hess, who is a white woman who chairs the African People's Solidarity Committee. And a week or so later, they did it to Jesse Neville, who chairs the African, the Uhuru Solidarity Movement. Uh, so all of these, uh, these are organizations that's uh, the, the solidarity front of our party. They, they hit them uh, as well. And uh, so they charged us and, uh, with uh, uh, being, uh, about being functioning kind of uh, as uh, uh, for foreign agents without having registered with the United States government, uh, uh, as agents uh, for a foreign country without registration, and for conspiring to, uh, to sow discord, to discord uh, in the United States. So the, to collect to both of these, a uh, uh, total of a 15-year sentence if they should convict us on this. So we, we went to, uh, to court on that, and uh, our lawyers uh, uh, filed uh, 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 a, a motion to have the charges dismissed based on First Amendment questions and saying uh, to the effect, as we had to do to, to file for the dismissal, that even if we had done what they said we did, it was free speech. That's allowable by the Constitution, uh, et cetera. It was an assault on free speech. But we say we didn't even do that, what they said we did, but we had to, but we said even if it happened, it was a matter of free speech. And so therefore, even the indictment was illegal. It took four months uh, after oral arguments around that, uh, that the court uh, magistrate declared that he united with the, with the government that, uh, that, uh, uh, that it should go to trial. Uh, that uh, what they claimed uh, that we were using Russian disinformation, and we said we have witnesses to say that what we're saying is absolutely true. They said it doesn't, disinformation, from our perspective, doesn't mean that it's untrue. It means that it's something that's being done, you know, uh, uh, at the behest of Russians, et cetera. Uh, so it was, it was uh, that's, the, that's the kind of case that we're involved in. So. So the court recently, again, uh, determined uh, that this thing can go to trial, and uh, uh, our lawyer filed a, a motion uh, uh, appealing that. Uh, so as it stands now, uh, we're supposed to go to trial in September, the September uh, 3rd, I think it is. Uh, uh, but uh, we, we're appealing that, but we've built an, inc built an incredible movement in the process uh, uh, with more than 40 different organizations from throughout this country uh, participating in this. Uh, we've built an anti-colonial free speech movement, uh, and uh, we are mobilizing uh, throughout this country and many places around the world. So that's more or less, less you know, where we stand and where, where this case is right now uh, and the kinds of things that we've been involved in since then. But I just want to say people talk a lot about Cointel Pro. And, and, you know, that's appropriate to talk about Cointel Pro. But before there was a Cointel Pro, uh, the actual creation of the FBI, the guy who played a primary role, his name was J. Edgar Hoover, uh, cut his teeth uh, uh, persecuting and then eventually prosecuting Marcus Garvey. Uh, that that W.E.B. Du Bois faced the very same charges that we are faced with. He was tried in 1952. Uh, because when he called for peace and they said the Russians were calling for peace, therefore he was employed by the Russians. They say that if we have a position and the Russians have the same position, then that means that we are, we are working for the Russians. They did this to W.E. They did this to Paul Robeson. They took him before the House of Un-American Activities. Uh, the point I would make is that uh, our people have never not fought for liberation and that, that freedom uh, uh, is illegal for slaves and colonized people. And so the laws that 
uh, created by the colonizers would prohibit uh, those who are colonized uh, from fighting for freedom. Well, the you, laws created by enslavers yeah. would prohibit that, and that's the kind of thing we're up against. Okay. I want to focus on the idea of freedom of speech because I think it's really, really pertinent right now. Uh, we're going to talk a bit more about the case, and but I also want to get from you the activities of the party as it stands right now. We'll be right back with more Open Door with Vince Robinson and my guest, Chairman O'Malley Yeshitela of the African People's Socialist Party, right here on 95.9 FM WOVU. Back in a minute. Hi, this is Tammy Payton, the CEO and founder of Pillars to Success Incorporated. You are listening to 95.9 FM WOVU, Our Voices United, Burton Bell Car Community Radio. Welcome back to Open Door with Vince Robinson. My guest is Chairman Omala Yeshitela of the African People's Socialist Party. Uh, you have outlined basically what the case against you is. Uh, you've also talked to us about the formation of the uh, Federal Bureau of Investigation and the role of J. Edgar Hoover in it. Um, I guess where where I am right now is just the the reality of different political parties. When I think about black folks in America, usually it's Republican or Democrat, and some of us resonate with the independent uh, parties that exist. Uh, your party is one of those parties. Uh, and it's interesting to me that the measures that were undertaken in St. Petersburg and in St. Louis, where you are, and the other things that happened a few years ago, as you pronounced it, that seemed to be extreme and way over the top. But intended to make a statement. And I guess what what kind of is puzzling to me is how few of black folk in this country have any awareness of a party like that. Back in the day, there were some of us who didn't embrace what the Black Panther Party was doing, even though it was more than just about being able to have a weapon standing on a street corner. They had breakfast programs. They were doing things to help sisters who were, you know, didn't have a husband in the household and so forth and so on. Um, so there's this there's been this this idea by some that we've got to do something and we've taken matters in our own hands what you did back when you started this party was one of those things. So I just just kind of want to get to your thoughts about how disconnected many of us are from the activities of a group like your group. Well, the fact of the matter is that most people uh, get their information from existing uh, media uh, uh, institutions and outlets and um uh, and in the 1960s, uh, it took them a while uh, to come to the conclusion that they were not going to publicize what revolutionaries were doing uh, anywhere around the world. But even at that time, uh, when they came to that conclusion, I think the Nation of Islam, Muhammad Speaks, had a publication distribution of something like uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, almost a million uh, readers per week. And the Black Panther Party ultimately had something like a quarter of a million people who were reading that newspaper. Uh, but they destroyed uh, that. They made the attack on that. And in the process of doing that, they they changed uh, a, a, a struggle that we were involved in uh, at this time for, for against colonialism, and they made it for integration, that the whole movement was now to become Americans. And uh, they killed Malcolm. You know, even if you look at the that they, the so-called voters' voting rights that we were supposed to have uh, in 1965, and I was part of a movement organizing black people, uh, voter registration and education. But when universal suffrage was attained in this country in uh, 1965, that's the same year uh, that they killed Malcolm X. Uh, 1968, they killed Martin Luther King. 1969, this a, a horrendous offensive that they made against the Black Panther Party, killing Fred Hampton. Uh, uh, arresting 21 members in New York, the Panther 21, uh, uh, and J. Edgar Hoover declaring, uh, the FBI declaring uh, that the Black Panther Party was the greatest threat to the internal security of this country. So a whole counter-offensive, uh, uh, counter-insurgency uh, movement was imposed on us and replacing revolutionary leaders uh, with uh, leaders of their choice. And so they shut down the door uh, to certain kinds of ideas that people don't have access to anymore. And so uh, uh, that's one of the problems why uh, uh, people don't uh, 
assumed to have an alternative to the Democratic Party. Uh, and so they are uh, locked into uh, uh, this kind of situation. And the work that we've done uh, 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 contributes to an understanding that there is an alternative, that the people can have power, and that uh, we have created uh, more than 50-some uh, 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 economic and other kinds of political institutions that demonstrates clearly we have power. We have transformed uh, 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 North St. Louis. If you And I'm, I'm inviting you and all of your your listeners to come, uh, you're not that far from us in, uh, here uh, uh, in St. Louis, to come to St. Louis and see what the Black Power Blueprint has done on the ground, uh, uh, where the housing, uh, people of Africans are being pushed out of the communities. If people show, show us uh, pictures of uh, what it looks like in Ukraine after what they said the Russians have done. Well, the Russians didn't attack North St. Louis, but you come and you see how the dilapidated housing, the devastation that African people have been living with, and then you have the African People's Socialist Party comes in. We are be rehabilitating uh, structures. We own something like more than 20 uh, uh, properties that we've created uh, in a very short period of time, since 19, uh, since uh, 2014, 15. Uh, we've we've uh, taken uh, buildings that have been uh, abandoned for years and years and rehabilitated them. We, we have created... Uh, 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 markets uh, for African people and what they characterize as food deserts. And, and these markets are not just where people can come and buy stuff, but people can sell stuff and so that there can be economic uh, activity within the community. So as opposed to money just coming in one door and going out the other door, some money has the ability to circulate in the community. People are able, are being hired in some of these institutions that we've created. And they are uh, Articulated as anti-colonial institution. We just had a furniture store in Oakland and a furniture store uh, in Philadelphia that's been there, that lasted for more than 25 years as economic development projects and as projects that were winning thousands of people who came through uh, to unity with the struggle of black people for reparations and exposing the genocidal attacks that's been made on African people. And this was something that thousands of white people also embraced in terms of participating and uniting with this. We created the African People's Solidarity Committee, and one of the reasons we survived beyond what was happening to us, to black people in our movement in the 1960s, is because we, we opened up a new front behind enemy lines. So in the, Afri in the communities of white people, uh, their organization, we have uh, organizations, uh, we have at, at least individual members of the, of the white uh, a front of our organization in 117 cities in this country. This is part of the problem that they have. And so we're not just encircled in the same way we were encircled before. Remember when they killed Fred Hampton? You didn't see us, uh, anything happening. They could have killed Fred Hampton. There was no movement effectively and meaningfully from the white community. When they killed Malcolm, you didn't see the white people rising up. It was black people who burned um, almost Washington, D.C. down when they killed Martin Luther King. But this time, when they came for us, they had to go to the white community, too. They had to attack the white community and people in the white community and put them in jail. This is the consequence of the kind of work that we've done. And then we've been building uh, uh, throughout Africa. We are in Africa uh, and various other places. So, so our party's been quite active, but these institutions that we've created are incredible. We created, uh, you know how in every uh, uh, community that we live in, <coughs> excuse me, so-called urban community, you see young youngsters who are playing basketball in the streets with makeshift uh, basketball hoops from bi bicycle rims hanging in places. We built a $160,000 basketball court. We got the property. We put it there. Uh, for the people, and the people, you know, are able to enjoy that. We're transforming this community so our children can see a future. We are constructing, even as we have, we just got a property a week or so ago uh, where we are putting Uhura Bakery Cafe uh, 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 on West Florida in this main corridor there that we are transforming, et cetera, so people can come there and work, and people can also have a place where they can access food. Uh, et cetera, in our own communities. This is the kind of work that we're doing, and this is anti-colonial work. This is not just some protest movement. This is engaging the people, involving the people in changing our own circumstances, changing our own conditions, and, and making it more difficult for parasites uh, to live off, uh, off of the, 
of the body of a colonized uh, African population. So, I mean, that's kind of sort of the stuff we're doing. And in the same time, uh, for example, we are building, we, we organized the Black is Back uh, 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 Coalition for Social Justice, Peace, and Reparations, part of the whole process of, of uh, uh, regenerating a, a struggle for self-determination of black people. There are 17 different organizations from around the country who participated in that, who have adopted a national black political agenda for self-determination. For the last eight years, we've been hosting uh, 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 schools to teach uh, African people how to participate in the electoral process and, 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 and from an anti-colonial perspective. We've, we've been doing this, and this is, the, this is the eighth year that's happening. This is the attack that they're making on us around elections. I mean, you know, it's not like we attacked the capital uh, of the U.S. and chased the vice president down the, down the halls talking about hanging him. It's not like we occupied the desk of uh, the third most powerful elected person in this country uh, 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 with our feet there. It, that wasn't us. What we've done is participate in the electoral process. We weren't kicking the elections off, out, or pushing them out. We were engaging in the elections. But they don't want us to engage in elections on our own terms. That's why Africans have not participated in elections because Malcolm X program has never been on the ballot. Because Martin Luther King's uh, Poor People's Campaign program has never been on the ballot. Because the 10 point program of the Black Panther Party has never been on the ballot. But now we're putting it on the ballot, and that's why we're under attack. Well, you know, it's interesting as we have this conversation, you have legislatures across the country, state legislatures uh, specifically that are many are, are controlled by Republicans and Republicans are doing as much as they can to try to turn back. The, the hands of time, so to speak, trying to erase history, uh, trying to new, neutralize the effectiveness of voters in their uh, states and so forth and so on. Uh, we have just a few more moments before we can be uh, conclude the broadcast. But uh, this is an election year uh, and it is going to be an extremely pivotal year. Uh, just within the, within the next minute or so, if you could just give us your view about the election, uh, the 1984 nightmare that we're living in right now uh, with respect to free speech and and uh, what some possible outcomes could be. Yeah, you know, I think that's extremely important because uh, what we see uh, is the state uh, being used as an instrument of uh, political uh, uh, involvement. Uh, even the ruling uh, Democrat and Republican candidates are using the power of the state. I mean, uh, Donald Trump has faced, I forgot how many, was it 90-some-odd indictments he's, he's uh, uh, faced, uh, and, uh, and uh, Joe Biden uh, was facing uh, he's, he's facing uh, uh, this whole impeachment thing that's happening in the Congress. Uh, uh, this is from uh, leadership from the other camp uh, and uh, was uh, facing impeachment for the same thing, uh, facing trial uh, for the same thing they indicted Trump for in terms of uh, uh, taking this, uh, 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 these information, uh, classified information and, and uh, inappropriately, you know, using them, taking them home, putting them in his garage and things like that. And so you these have this whole thing that's out there. This, this election is, is crazy. Uh, uh, all around this country, there are actions going on, many of them under the radar, uh, where groups of people uh, under the leadership of a certain camp of, the, of, of uh, uh, contending forces that are uh, often associated with the Republican Party, but I don't even know if these... Uh, these titles, uh, names mean that much anymore. But Steve Bannon, you know, their people are running for local offices. They intend to win this election uh, if it comes off uh, by controlling who counts the election, where the poll, where the where the uh, the polls are going to be located, uh, what the conditions are going to be, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's the threat of uh, of uh, using the court system uh, to uh, disallow different people uh, from. Uh, from running for office. It's an incredible, uh, credible and sig significant moment in history. Uh, and uh, the outcome of this is, is not known. And, and we are part of that attack on what the election should look like, uh, uh, that the government has lost uh, absolute control of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, of th that process. And so the state has involved itself in a very open kind of way, unlike any thing that we've seen uh, for a very, very long time uh, as, as since, since the whole issue of the civil rights movement when 
the state finally involved itself and say black people have a right to vote, you know. So it's a it's a very serious moment in history, uh, and and uh, the outcome of we have to help uh, our people recognize that we do have agency, that we don't have to be stuck with the Democrats or the Republicans nor any of the others, that there are alternatives, and these alternatives are manifesting themselves where we are right now in St. Louis and in St. Petersburg and other places where we're doing oh, work oh, at. So, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yes, I appreciate it. We're we're out of time, unfortunately, but I hope this is the beginning of a continued dialogue because there's so many other things that I wanted to talk to you about, and we can create a plan in order to have that conversation at, at a future point in time. Thanks for joining me on Open Door today. Thank you. All right. I invite you and all of your listeners to come to St. Louis. Come and see okay. what we're doing. All right. And to those of you right, who you. are listening, as always, know yourself, love yourself, be yourself. Make today your absolute best day. Peace.